we might cause you not to think that this is Jesus who has spoken these things. So this morning, the, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to be in verses 7 through 9. Matthew 18, 7 through 9, and the title of my message is this. Why did Jesus say, cut off your hand and foot and gouge out your eye? That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? And, you know, our hands are precious to us. Our feet are precious. Our eyes are precious. And I want you to think about something before I pray. What would it take for you to be... to for you to willingly, for you to willingly cut off your hand, your foot, and gouge out your eye. You know, what would cause someone to willingly do that? Well, let's pray, and then we're going to jump into the Word of God. Lord, as we are beginning this morning, I want to ask again that you would, by your Spirit, awaken us. Lord, you love us. Um, you love your people. We know in our minds often that, that you want uh, what's best for us. You look out for our welfare. And, and Jesus, you said that you want us to have life. You want us to have it abundantly. But sometimes because of who we are, because of our uh, sinful nature, because of uh, temptation, sometimes your words that are meant to bring life are difficult for us to hear, and they're difficult for us to receive. So I'm asking that this morning, Lord, right now, as we are gathered in your name, that you would, by your Spirit, open up the eyes of our hearts afresh. I ask that you would help us to see the truth, that you would help us to see your love, and that you would help our ears to hear your voice again. This, this morning, right now, where we're sitting, where we are, Help us to respond to your love. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, on April 26th, 2003, while hiking alone through the Southern Lands region in Utah, Utah, Aaron Ralston dislodged an 800-pound boulder, which ended up landing on his right arm, pinning him between the boulder and the canyon wall. And that's not the worst of it. One of the, the major problems that he had was that he didn't tell anyone where he was going when he went on the hike. And he was miles and miles out in the wilderness where no one would have known to look for him. So after five days, he took five days to try to chisel around that rock to get it out and to pull his arm out. He couldn't get it off. So he had two choices. Number one, he could keep his arm. He could keep his arm and die. That was choice number one. Or he could cut it off and live. Well, Aaron chose the latter of the two, and he took a dull multi-tool pocket knife, and he began amputating his arm off of himself until about an, an hour later he was finally free. After climbing out of the canyon, he hiked for about six more miles until he came upon a family who was hiking in, in the canyon. And they, uh, the reports are that they gave him some Oreos and some water. And they got him, and he was better. No, and he got the medical attention that he needed to begin healing. You know, um, this was a, is a true life story. This is a true life illustration that Ralston had two choices. Number one, stay connected to something that he cherished, his arm, but if he did, he would die, or cut it off, lose it forever, and live. He had to, in other words, he had to choose between life and death. He had to make a choice between life and death, and that's what our passage this morning is about, choosing between life and and death. And as we dive into this passage, let me prepare us all that today's words from Jesus, they are indeed heavy. They are indeed strong. They are indeed sobering, but they are also words of life. They are words of life to anyone who has ears to hear and who will respond to them. 
So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew 18, three verses, verses 7 through 9. Jesus says, Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. Verse 9. And if your eye causes you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, what is Jesus trying to communicate here? Is is he encouraging his listeners to practice self-mutilation? Well, take a, a deep breath because the answer, fortunately, is no. That is not what Jesus is teaching us here. Fortunately, what he's doing is he's using hyperbole, which is a graphic illustration on steroids. He, he's, he's using this illustration in order to get the full attention of his audience. And he is using severe language because he is issuing a severe warning. I don't want us to miss that at the very beginning here by going, oh, okay, he's not telling me to do that. Well, he's telling you to do something that's, gra- that's very graphic like that. Now, notice how in verse 7, I want us to look at verse 7 again. On two occasions, he uses the fiery three-letter word, woe. It's not W, is it H-O-O-A? It's not that one, okay? It's woe. It's a word that God often uses in the scripture. In love, now don't miss this, in love he uses this word. When he's seeking to awaken or to stir up his people, when we have become complacent and lethargic, or if we're drifting away into sin, he wants to warn us of impending danger. And so he begins with woe, letting us know that judgment and destruction will destroy those who ignore his words. So what is Jesus warning his people about? Let's look at verse 7 again. He says, woe to the world for temptations to sin. See that there three times You see the word temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom that temptation comes. And the Greek word for temptation here is a word that means a cause for stumbling. If you have another translation other than the ESV, you might have the word stumbling block put right there where we have the word temptation. And it's a cruel picture of an enemy going on a pathway where someone who is blind is walking and taking a block and putting it in front of them so that they will trip up, so that they will no longer be able to continue on their pathway. And Jesus is teaching us that sin has the potential of causing us to fall, causing us to stumble. And so he's warning us to beware of the temptations of sin. So Just let me make it very clear what the point of this passage is. Jesus is teaching that the point of this passage is that sin is seductive. It is toxic and deadly. Therefore, we must aggressively, we must aggressively do whatever we must do to eradicate temptations of sin out of our life. That's what this passage is about. We've got to cut them off. And, you know, although what's interesting is although this this passage is it comes from a place of love from God, a a place of warning, it can often be grating and irritating and even sound unloving to anyone who wishes to stay asleep. Have you ever had somebody wake you up, try to wake you up when you didn't want to wake up? It's, It's very annoying. Proverbs says that you can sound a trumpet of joy in the morning, and it will not be received that by someone. It's not, doesn't sound good to someone that wants to stay asleep or someone that wishes to remain comfortable in their sin. That's a good indicator right now of how we're receiving this, this word. Does this sound loving to us? It, you know, it's kind of like when you're watching TV. Um, have you ever been watching TV and your favorite show was on, and all of a sudden this noise goes, and it's uh, 
This comes up on the screen. This is, a, is not a test. A nationwide state of emergency is in effect. Please stand by and await further instructions. This is not a test. Now, what do you think when that comes up on your screen? And it's, it's right, it's the three-point shot at the buzzers in the air. What are you thinking? Uh, I know this is wrong, but when this happens to me so many times, I thought this warning right here does not pertain to me. <laughs> Whatever they're warning about, it's not, it's not going to happen to me. And you know what I'm afraid of, though, is that that is how too many times we can be like in the church when God gives a warning. We can think, you know what, this is annoying. It's getting in the way of what I'm wanting to do. This is not pertaining to me. And, and that might be what you're thinking this morning as, you're going, as we're going through this passage. You're, you're thinking clearly Jesus can't be talking to me because he's warning people about going to hell. And I know I'm not going to hell because I believe in Jesus. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so you might be assumed, uh, uh, tempted to assume that Jesus is talking to somebody else, that he's talking to somebody outside the church. But is he? Is this message for somebody outside the church? Is this message for the church? Well, in order to determine this, we need to look at something which is called context. Last week, Pastor Terry told us that context is what? King. Context is king. We've got to read our, when we read our Bibles, we need to know what context was it delivered in. Who was it spoken to? And I want to go to verse 1 of this chapter, of, of uh, chapter 18. And let's look at what Jesus says. He says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put in the midst of them and said. Okay, so look at that. Who is Jesus talking to? Let's do the next slide here. Wow, that looked good, didn't it? The disciples. He's talking to the disciples. And he does this from verse 3 to the end of the chapter. He continues to talk to the church. So I want to make sure that as we're moving through this passage, you don't suddenly think this, this message is for somebody else. He's actually talking to his disciples. And so you might be thinking, then why is Jesus talking about cutting off your hand and, and gouging out your eye in order not to go to hell, into the eternal flames? That's the question I asked when I was going through this passage. I'm like, why is he talking about that um, if I'm already in him and if I'm saved? I mean, I, you may be saying, I thought you, you, you've been teaching every week that if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, that you're good. Uh, James, don't you believe in eternal security? Don't, don't you believe once saved, always saved? Yeah, don't you believe in the perseverance of the saints? And I would say, yes. Scripture teaches that. Scripture teaches that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. Scripture teaches us that no one who is in Christ can be snatched out of his hand. Eternal uh, salvation, uh, eternal security is it's clearly taught in the Bible. I want to be clear that it does. However, throughout history, there are many who are in the midst of the church. There are many who are in the midst of true believers who sincerely believe that they belong to God. They believe that they belong with the people of God when reality is that they don't. They are what the Word of God would call deceived. And I want to stop here real quick because when we start talking about things like this, people who are saved can often be like, oh, no. This is one of those messages, am I really the real deal, okay? If, that, if you're feeling that, that's a good sign, okay? In the sense, not that you're freaking out, but that you're, that you're wanting to be aware of what Scripture teaches and of where you're headed. This is, this is, this is a good thing, so, but I want you to calm down, okay? If you're feeling that way right now, there's a good chance that you really are his because if you, if you weren't his, you might not even, you probably wouldn't even care what I'm talking about right here, okay? So this is, I want to just make sure that, uh, I don't rattle the flock and the sheep. Those of you who are hypersensitive, because you, I can be like that. So I just want to be sensitive to the flock, okay? But Scripture does teach us that we need to test ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13.5, 
Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test? Then in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, the writer of Hebrews says, Take care, or take heed, or watch out, or, or pay attention, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come, now look at this, for we have come to share in Christ if, there's if, here's the test, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. I think the writer of Hebrews is teaching that, the, that uh, sin seeks to, to drag us away from Christ. One of the true signs that you are his is that you will remain to the end. Okay, you will continue to persevere to the end. And one of the things that we need to communicate, uh, what we need is we need community. That, that's what the church, one of the things that the church is for, is to protect one another, to watch over one another, to care for one another. Day after day, we need encouragement. And I also want to point out that unrepentant sin affects not only the sinner, not the one that's sinning. Hidden, unrepentant sin doesn't just affect you, it affects the entire body. You cannot sin in private and it not affect the entire body. You, we've got to understand that. We're connected. If your hand is sick, it's going to affect the whole body and spread throughout the whole body if it's not taken care of. And Jesus, knowing this, comes to his disciples, and in love, he warns us about the horrors of sin, how it can seductively deceive and lure us away from God and ultimately drag us into the, into the fires of hell. Uh, but we've got to take care that when we preach the gospel, listen to me, when we preach the gospel, we've got to take care that we preach the entire gospel, the entire message, not just parts of it. Um, it's not just believe in Jesus. Now, that is part of the gospel. But in Mark 1.15, Jesus says, when he, when he comes on to the scene, he says, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Look what he says. He says, repent and believe. Not just believe. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to repent? Well, repentance requires a change. Repentance is a call to change. Change two things. Change your mind and change your direction, the way that you are going. And sometimes we can be tempted to leave this part of the, of the gospel out because it can be offensive. Because, again, people want to stay where they're at. They want to stay comfortable. Jesus loves us where we're at, but he won't leave us where we're at. True love causes us to change, to be transformed. I like what Kevin DeYoung says. He says, more often than not, when I find people who, I, who know of Christ and are not interested in Christ, it's simply because they do not want to change. They are not interested in someone telling them who to be or how to think, or how to live, even if that someone is God. Then he goes on to repentance. Repentance is the stumbling block for so many. It is, the, it is one thing to say, believe in Jesus. And in fact, many churches, I think, produce many false Christians and false conversions because all they say to people is believe in Jesus. They never say repent, and the two must always go together. In repentance, there is, a, uh, there is confession of sin. In other words, there is an agreement, Lord, that is sin. You agree with God, and that's what it means to confess. There is a confession of sin. There is contrition for sin. That means that there's sorrow, there's remorse, there's regret for sin. 
And there is consecration to a new way of life. In other words, God, when we repent, God sets us apart for a higher purpose. And what the Word of God teaches in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, first couple of chapters, it teaches that when God created all things, He created us, man and woman, He created us to be His image bearers. In other words, we were created to be his representatives here on earth, to reflect his glory all throughout the earth. What does God tell Adam and Eve? He says, be fruitful and multiply. And you know what? In the beginning, before sin, we all knew that. We, we knew that there was nothing better than serving God. There was nothing in us that resisted God's authority. There was nothing in us that resisted him telling us what to do. We joyfully, naturally did what he called us to do. But in chapter 3 of Genesis, man, as we know, rebelled. And instead of wanting to be like God and reflect his glory, we wanted to be God and receive the glory that was only meant for God. And when we did that, when we rebelled against God, something inside of us died. And what was once natural to us, serving, glorifying, worshiping, loving God, it became unnatural. And ever since then instead of running to God, we have been running away from God. And that's why in the Gospels, when Jesus steps onto the court, the first thing he says is repent, turn around, change your mind, come back to God. Turn away from the sin that is leading you to slaughter. Lay down your weapons, in other words, surrender. And here's the good news. I will receive you back. I will forgive you of your sins and I will receive you back. And notice something in this passage today. Notice that Jesus does not say, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, I'm going to come over there and I'm going to cut it off. He doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, you cut it off. He says, you willingly cut it off. And this is something we need to understand about God in this life. God is not going to force you in this life to serve him. He's not going to force you to love him. He's not going to force you to come to him against your will. Everything in the kingdom of God, everything in heaven, those of us who are in heaven, will be voluntary, done out of a heart of love for God. And so this morning, today's passage is for the church. It's for us, Reach Life. This is a message that is for those of us who claim to know and love Jesus. And so what I want you to ask yourself this this morning as we've been going through the words of Jesus, is there anything, is there anything in your life that is leading or has the potential to lead you away from Jesus? Is there anything in your life that you know of that you're allowing to be in your life that is tempting you to sin, that's deadening your heart? That's making your hearing dull so that you're no longer able to hear the voice of God in a loving way. Is another way to test this is is this are his commandments? Are they becoming annoying? Are they becoming restrictive? Are they becoming burdensome to you? As you're thinking about that, you might be thinking about relationships that you're in. Is there a relationship or a friendship that is leading you away from Jesus? When you get around this group of people or this person, you seem to just keep falling back into besetting sins. Or maybe it's the, the uh, a relationship that's forbidden in Scripture, um, and you're flirting with it. You, you know you shouldn't be, but you're flirting with it. It could be a coworker, an acquaintance that's tempting you to cross forbidden boundaries. Or maybe it, it's a pet sin that you keep hidden in the dark. And you, instead of turning to God in your times of stress and anxiety, you turn to it. And uh, you think in your mind that you've tamed it, that you've got it under control. But the truth is, it's got you deceived because you uh, trying to tame sin is like trying to tame a baby rattlesnake. Eventually, that snake is going to grow up and it's going to kill you.
Maybe another thing is that you have access to something. Um, you're allowing access into your life. You're, you're doing what the scripture calls, calls making provision for the flesh. Um, it could be, let me just be blunt here. It could be your, your cell phone. It could be the internet in your home. Um, I, I was listening to a, a pastor preach, and he was talking about some of us, and he was being serious, and I tend to agree with him. Some of us, uh, we can't handle this. We, we, we really can't. And we need to go back to the old school flip phones if you're going to ha have a phone because we can't handle it, and it's killing us. You know, some of us, uh, if, if you're not willing to, to give your wife your password and you get nervous every time someone grabs your phone or gets on your computer, what if? That's a good sign that you might not be able to handle it. And you might go, well, I, I couldn't do this. I can't live without this. And that's why Jesus says it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. It's often the very thing that's valuable to us or that we see valuable. It's a pain. Your hand, cutting your hand off is a painful thing. And repentance, listen. It's something that Jesus is calling all of us to. This is a continual discipline as a believer. And this is a proof. Here's the proof that you are really his. You repent when God, when Jesus comes to you. Like in this passage. And he reveals sins in our, sin in our life. And we, we respond. Because like, remember the prodigal son who was eating with the pigs? You come to a place in your life that you're just done with it. You come to an end to yourself. And, and, you know, and you know what? True repentance, when you come to that place, you, you don't care what your reputation looks like now. You're, you're tired of eating with the pigs. You're tired of eating the slop. And you just want to come clean. You want to come home because true repentance is that desire to have Jesus more than anything in life. That's what true repentance repentance is so how do we get there what does that look like in a, in a practical way well I've got three gets three things we need to get number one you need to get rid of whatever that thing is in your life that's tempting you to sin get rid of it um, burn your bridges do your part to get rid of it Secondly, you need to get others involved. I, I cannot <laughs> overstress this, this one right here. We are not meant to live alone. We're not meant to fight temptation alone. Um, we need to get others involved, surround ourselves with people that we trust. Now, this might be something and probably will be something you're not going to share with everybody. But get someone that you can share with. Um, and someone that's I'm going to use a word that kind of makes you scared in a good way. Uh, I remember when I was a, a youth pastor at a, a church, we, went, we took a group to camp, summer camp, and I've told some of you this story, but we had a, a teenage boy and a teenage girl come up to me, and they were like, man, I've been struggling with uh, temptation, and, uh, and I was like, that is awesome. And they're like, and we're going to hold each other accountable. <laughs> okay, do not do that. You need to find someone that can hold you accountable, okay? That, that's something that's very... Important. So get rid of it, get others involved, and then the third one is get the gospel. This is so crucial here because, listen, if you read this, you can read this passage wrong and think that cutting your hand off or cutting your foot out, gouging your eyes is going to make God love you more and forgive you of your sins. That is not what this is teaching here. This is not what Jesus is saying here. We've got to understand the gospel in order to truly do this the right way. Let's look at 1 Peter 2, 24 through 25. Peter writes, he, this is speaking of Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. This is the cross. This is his death. That we might, here's the motivation, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That we might die, that we might cut off our hand, gouge out our eye. That, that's what that's saying. Our motivation is 
that he bore our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds you have been healed. And look at this. I love verse 25. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And Jesus stands before us and he says, look, don't look so much at what you're doing, but look at what I did for you. Before you cut off your hand or your gouge at your eye or cut off your foot, realize that I was cut off from my father because of your sin. Realize that first. Realize that I love you so that you might die willingly to sin and live to righteousness. That's our motivation. That's what we need to get, the gospel of what Christ has done for us. Because when we do, it melts our hearts and enables us and gives us that desire to want to be free from our sin. And maybe this morning, as you're counting the cost, you're wondering if it will be worth it. And I want to point something out from the story of Aaron Ralston. You know, he was uh, in that uh, canyon for five days trying to free himself from the rock. And he finally came to his senses and realized that it would be better for him to cut off his hand and live crippled than it would be to keep it and die. You can see a picture right here of what he looks like. Now, as you might imagine, uh, cutting his arm off with a dull knife didn't feel good. Uh, it was intense. It was fiery. It was bloody. Uh, especially, he says, when he came to his artery before finally being set free. But look, listen to what he says. This is a direct quote from him. He says, cutting off my arm was not the horrific moment that people imagined it might be. He says, I was smiling when I stepped out of my grave and into my life again. It was the greatest moment of my life. He lost his hand, but he gained his life. And today, that guy's a multimillionaire. <laughs> Get re yeah, we're going to go prosperity here. He was written a book about his story. He's traveled the, the globe motivating people. He, there's even a movie that's uh, starring James Franco in it uh, that's made to, uh, a drama, to dramatize uh, this, his time in the, his five days in, the, in this tomb. He gained much more than he lost. But I do want to be clear that Jesus isn't promising all that. He's promising more, much more. He's promising himself first and foremost. He's promising access to God. He's promising the opportunity to forsake our sin and return, knowing, return to knowing and serving the God who created us and who loves us. In other words, he's promising eternal life to all who will repent and believe. So this morning, I'll ask it again. Is there anything in your life that Jesus is calling you to cut off? Well, I want to encourage you not to put that off. I want to encourage you to respond in faith, knowing that when you do, God is going to empower you to step out of your grave and into life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I love you. Lord Jesus, we love you um, only because you first loved us. And I, I love you because you are someone uh, who doesn't just say nice things to make us feel good. You say what we need to hear. Uh, Lord, these are hard words, but they are also words of life. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you will do what only you can do. And help us to respond in faith. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.